I'm Lois Wood, Lois Warren Wood. I went to um, high school, three different high schools my senior year because my parents were divorced. So I ended up at Middletown High School with, I thought, no chance of college. And Mum opened in 1966, which is the year I graduated. So that's how I got to Mum. I got a National Defense student loan, and I wouldn't be a teacher if it wasn't for Mum. Anyone else? Why, how did you get here? My parents moved here to Springboro right after I graduated from high school in 67. And the money for another university didn't come through. So I enrolled the week the classes began in 67. And I graduated in 72. But the thing I remember the most about this university is that they kept me employed on the work-study program. I, they always made sure I had a job, that I got my 20 hours in every week, because I was later supporting myself and putting myself through school. And I worked for David Ballard in the speech department. I worked for Malcolm Saddam in the English department. I worked for Claire Easton in the front office. And they just always took care of me and made sure I had the hours that I needed and a lot of wonderful opportunities that I never would have had on a larger campus. I worked with Claire Easton. I made posters for artists and lecture series. I was able to, she, had me intro do the introductions for many of our guests, especially once we had Dave Finkelman Auditorium. So I got to meet uh, Wendell Young. Wendell Young? Um, National Urban League. Andrew, Andrew Young. No, yes. and Whitney. Whitney Young. I got to meet and introduce Whitney Young. Um, we saw Julian Bond here. Andrew. Andrew. Yes. Sorry. Andrew and Julian Bond. Sorry. That's yes. right. And um, Lerone Bennett, uh, who was publisher and editor, I believe, of, Ed, of Ebony Magazine. And to have actually met these people uh, and people who had such influence. Um, it was very, very valuable skill that, that, that I was given by Mrs. Easton and the other people here at the campus. Anyone else? My name's Ron Johnson. I don't want to monopolize a lot of time, but let me just tell you a little bit about myself shortly after I graduated from high school. I graduated from Middleton High School in 1968, and I wanted to pursue an educational career. But the money wasn't there, not at all. But a few years, like two or three years prior to my graduating from high school, they built this thing called Miami University of Middletown. And it was relatively close to my home, and it was a cheaper alternative than uh, I would be facing if I went to any other uh, institution of higher learning. The, my grades were there to allow me to get into Oxford, but I couldn't afford it. So I applied here and was accepted, and I, was a student here for two years, and then transferred over to the uh, Oxford campus. I have many other stories I can tell you, but I don't want to monopolize time. So that's my story, and that's my relationship with Miami University Middletown. Except for one large exception, which I would love to mention, uh, I met my dear wife here <laughs> over a game of foosball. Right and there, right there, right there. Right there. <laughs> and then, uh, evolved into what became a Miami merger. We've been married for 44 years. We're proud of that. That's my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> we I watched, oh, I'm sorry. I watched my mother graduate from Miami in 1966 and looked around and decided, maybe I'll go to Miami. Uh, when the time came in 69 to enroll, I had 
the choice of buying another sports car or living on campus in Oxford and I opted for a sports car <laughs> here. Became a uh, disciple of Malcolm Saddam who mentored me and shaped my career. Uh, at one point I thought I'd make my living doing creative writing. I'm a school psychologist. I've been boring psychological reports for about 39 years now. Okay, my story began at Oxford, and because of financial circumstances, I ended up finishing my college career here at Middletown. And I think what I found very interesting is the flexibility that the campus offered me. Uh, first of all, there were two other girls who had gone to high school with me, and we had had Spanish from the fifth grade on. And in those days, you did not test for placement. They automatically assumed we knew a great deal. So we were thrown into a 300 level class with Dr. Schuler. We met in his office, the three of us. If someone was absent, there was a phone call. It's like, you need to get here because I'm not translating your pages today. Um, the other thing that was very flexible was that there were maybe a dozen of us who were English majors. And there were certain requirements. So we would make agreements. I'll take your linguistic class if you'll take your English history class. And so we would get 10 people to take the class. They would agree to offer the class. They brought over instructors or professors from Oxford who were making overtime, and we didn't have to travel. So that was a good one. If there was the case when I actually needed a class that no one was in agreement, then people like Harold Nadel had a one-on-one -on -one with me in the office, and. They, I think, were volunteering their time because they got a gift card for me at the end when I finished my credits. And actually, that was harder than being in a room. And then I will offer one other little insight that when I went to grad school at Oxford, everybody complained about how small the classes were. And I thought they were huge because I wasn't used to 25 kids in a class necessarily. I had 10 and 12 with full-fledged professors. Anyone else with that one? The flexibility or the kinds of experiences because it was a small campus? I'd say the flexibility. Um, I went from 66 to 78 because I went two years full time, worked as a um, switchboard operator, except one semester I did work as a janitor because we had worked full time and I didn't want to sit behind the switchboard all day. I could get up and move around with that one. And, um, but the other worked 20 hours a week on the switchboard. And there's a couple stories about answering the switchboard, I can tell too. <laughs> and, um, but the fact is that with that flexibility, I went two years full time. I didn't want to be in debt anymore, so I went part time for two years and worked full time. Then I got married, went part time, had a baby, went part time. <laughs> Uh, came back, had another baby, but the point of it is, is Dr. Um, Lehman, who was my advisor. I had been out for two years with my second child. That was my longest span, not coming to mom. I really thought it was going to disintegrate when I graduated because it had been such a large part of my life. And if you ever went in his office, his office was the typical absent minded professor's office. It's books and papers all over the place. And I walked in there after being not here for two years. I was a social studies major, so he knew me pretty well. He literally pulled a paper from a pile of books and stuff and said, Miss Warren, oh, Mrs. Wood, this is where you are now. And well, he set me up for my, the rest of my courses. Mr. Layman was always there for you and a great teacher here. Jim Lyman was a great guy, and I copied his organizational system. <laughs> My desk. <laughs> I, I too. <laughs> I felt like the professors and instructors took a much more personal interest in us here than when I had to transfer to Oxford campus to graduate on schedule. I ended up having to take classes at Middletown, Hamilton, and Oxford campus. My senior year, that was a real struggle. But the, the personal atmosphere here was one of the things that made it great. Joe, the security cop, who spent more time <laughs> yes. counseling people than police were, uh, 
trying to marry my wife to somebody else in the elevator <laughs> once. <laughs> there, there's several good stories I can't tell because of statute of limitations. <laughs> Mr. Lehman also wanted the faculty and Miami University to understand the students here. And at one time, we had colloquiums here at, at noon. You just brought, your, brought in a lunch, and you came and sat, and, I, and he asked me to come. And I said, I can. I've got a three-year-old. He said, bring him. That's what they need to know. And I'd bring him. He had a lunchbox full of matchbox cars. I gave him his instructions. He'd sit underneath the table play matchbox cars and we talked, whatever the topic was, but Mr. Lehman insisted on that so that people would understand the students that we have going here. Any other professors? Yeah. Any well, other I, would, I would just reiterate um, that I thought all of the professors here cared about it. And that was shown just in many ways, you know, just talking with you in the hallways, um, and I uh, really appreciated that. I, I guess I didn't expect it from college professors, but because our campus was small, um, we got that one-on-one, -on -one, I felt like, from the professors. I can recall being in an exam in Dr. Krakowski's class, and a student was upset, ran out the door, and Krakowski was out the door before it shut to find out what was wrong. I felt like they cared about us, and they knew us. They knew us by name, even if we weren't necessary in their classes. Um, so. I was lucky enough to be here all four years. I was an elementary education major, and there was a program here for us. And every professor I had knew my name, knew about me, asked questions, and they cared. And uh, so many of us went through here all four years, and I ended up at Carlisle Schools teaching third grade most of my time. And then a lot of the people that I went to school with ended up in Carlisle also. My experience um, with the, the Middletown campus was actually before there was a campus. Um, the campus didn't open here until 1966, but I took a class in 1965 at Middletown High School as a night school uh, Miami uh, provided. I've tried to remember who the professor was, but I'm doing good to remember yesterday, so <laughs> I can't go back 50 years. But uh, that showed that the community wanted to be a part of what was going to become this glorious thing called Miami Middletown. And there were a lot of adults um, who took classes, took advantage of those night classes until that campus, you know, was uh, completed and opened in 1966. I've done a lot of things uh, on the campus since then you know, but I did not actually get my uh, degree from Middletown. I did Oxford. But it's been important as part of the community. And many of the people that they are mentioning, uh, Claire Easton and David Ballard, I, I had a chance to either work with them or teach with them. So there's always connections uh, uh, with, with Miami. Uh, I've served along with uh, John on the um, Miami, yeah, Miami alumni, the Middletown branch, and uh, as part of uh, uh, that uh, group, we had given out uh, scholarships to several freshmen. Uh, when they called them freshmen, first-year students, I think they're called now. But uh, we, we, I think over the years that we did that, we, we did give out thousands of dollars. So. My story is a little different. Um, I came here because my family lived here in town. I worked for my parents. Um, so I wanted to 
continue working with them as well as working on campus to pay for my education. I got a job at the Gardner Harvey Library um, through Mrs. Brown, Virginia Brown. Um, she was a neighbor of my grandmother, so I kind of had a little bit of an in, having known her from childhood growing up in my grandmother's neighborhood. Um, I also um, was very active in uh, theater in high school and was interested in working with the director over here, Ron Fetzer at the time. Um, so I worked uh, on a lot of shows and productions in the theater, in the uh, Dave Finkman Auditorium. Um, knew it every square inch of it by the time I left here for three years. Um, but I had a little different experience with in instructors here. Um, I was in the systems analysis uh, curriculum and they didn't have any full-time instructors on campus. Uh, they were brought over from Oxford and we met with them once a week and doing computer programming. Um, we would punch our programs on punch cards, send them through the library, inner office mail. Uh, we'd be lucky if we got them back three or four days later um, to correct and send back over. Um, so that was all before personal computers and terminals and uh, e email and internet. And, uh, so it was a difficult time to uh, study uh, computer programming anyway at the time. Um, didn't get to really get to know my professors as well as some of the locals. Um, I did have a couple on campus that I really enjoyed uh, being in the class. One was Phil Hines who taught English. Um, he made the class a lot of fun. Um, the other one was Colonel Ray Finning, who taught a government class that I took and uh, really enjoyed his class a lot, too. Do you remember they had their own language called music? Music, yep. I remember music. No, I've never used it outside no. of all the classes over here, but it was an introductory course. Right. Yeah. Developed on campus, I believe, in Oxford. That's correct. John talks about the theater, but Mom also had a radio station, and there was a speaker's bureau um, that students participate in, so there were a lot of different opportunities. And I think there was a great deal of diversity among the students. Uh, classmates were Vietnam veterans. I was young and taking classes, but I was sitting next to women who had associate's degrees in teaching, and they were in the classroom. They were coming back because of some sort of regulations, I guess, that said they had to have a bachelor's. Mm -hmm. I was too young to care about that, but they really <laughs> added a lot to the classroom because they were telling actual real stories about their experiences in the classroom. So you learned from them. Um, just because you had different generations and different ages, you learned a great deal. So you had all of these people coming together. And I think the campus served various counties. People like Tim came from Warren County, and so we, we sort of melded and meshed. We were all in the same boat, and we became close. And it wasn't just about studies. They tried to introduce an element of fun into what we were doing as well as being a college student. They try to make it as if we were on a, an actual college campus, not just a branch somewhere. Uh, the very first um, AD, athletic director, Lynn Darbyshire, I wouldn't say that name, tried to develop a series of programs, series of sports uh, that we could have, that we could participate in, uh, some co-ed, some just male or some female. We had a uh, a football team. It wasn't much of a football team, no padding, but we played Miami University Hamilton. And that was fun. Uh, they also, in the fall of 69, I told you this earlier, they had um, the very first ping pong tournament at Miami University <laughs> Middletown. They had two ping pong tables right over there. And I'm proud to say that I won the very first. <laughs> Miami University Middletown Ping Pong Championship. But it was just a fun time. 
It wasn't just about studying. The studies were very important, incredibly important, because you're trying to develop a, a foundation for what you're going to be doing the rest of your life. But you got to stop and smell the roses too. Have a good time while you're here. I think as Eleanor mentioned with forensics, it was very active. And I think and we competed with those of large, much larger campuses and held our own, thanks to Sue DeWine and Diane Berkeley. And we hosted tournaments here as well as competed. And it gave me an opportunity to travel with the, camp, with the team. Uh, which was not something we did back then. I don't think many of us did a lot of traveling uh, to other states like we would do today. And so we got to go to Pennsylvania and Virginia and Maryland and compete in intercollegiate activities because of their, their hard work and, and the teams that we had. And Mom put forth a team that was, that was comparable to many of those and competed state and national. My story is a little bit different. I came to Miami Middletown as a non-traditional student. I had been out of high school for seven years when I came and I just walked on campus and wanted to know more. And one of the admissions counselors said, well, classes start next week. Do you want to apply? <laughs> and I applied and they registered me for an orientation to come in and get registered for courses. It was like two days later. Um, June Finney, she was a, an advisor at the time. She sat down with me. I cried the whole time because I was so terrified of coming to college. And she looked at me and said, uh, you're going to graduate. You're going to do great. And I'm going to be there to see you uh, walk when you do. And she was. I graduated in 2011 with the Bachelor's of Integrative Studies. Um, I graduated with, with honors. <laughs> so I, I was excited to do that. While I was here, I was a student worker. Um, Jim Slager actually came looking for me to be a student worker for him. And he came right after my first semester, and I was so nervous. Um, to still be a student. I was still trying to figure things out. And we had gone to a dinner in Oxford with the president together and sat, he sat by me. It was for students that finished their first semester with a 4.0. And so he sat by me and we talked and then he pursued me as a student worker for weeks after that and I just kept not calling it back. I would call him back. I wasn't ready for that. And finally, he got me on the phone and said, just come in and talk to me, and I did. And he taught me into being his student worker. And so I was a student worker from my second semester until the day I graduated. And now that I've graduated, I've come back and I'm full-time staff. So I loved Miami so much. It was uh, my family. They just put their arms around me and embraced me. And it was, it was wonderful. I was a student worker. I had scholarships every semester that I was here. Um, I was part of student government. I was a campus ambassador. Uh, worked for the dean's office. Worked for the information desk. Worked for student affairs and student athletics. Was faculty support secretary for a while. And now I work in the e-learning department. So. <laughs> so. All kinds of skills. I think one, one story that, that sort of pertains to what's happening nowadays that we forget what happened when we were in school. It was Vietnam and there were a lot of controversies. And as I worked on the switchboard, two times, I believe it was in 67, or see, 67, 68, two times that school year, we had gotten uh, bomb threats and we had to evacuate the building. The third time, we got the bomb threat. I was the one who got the call. And of course, I went to tell Dr. Bennett. They made the decision that we weren't going to evacuate the building. So I had to sit there and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend things were just hunky dory. And they were, it worked. But um, as a 19 year old, that was quite memorable. <laughs>
a little bit about a third of the war that was going on at the time that we were in school. Vietnam, at the side of the world, a lot of people were just here, a lot of males were here, strictly to avoid the draft. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And I had the draft implemented, and it worked as well as anything could, conscription does, but then they decided to change that. In December of 1969, they decided to replace the draft with a lottery system. The lottery system being defined as they would put a ping pong ball with a number, uh, the number being comprised of a day and a month, and put them all in this uh, very large tumbler. And then one evening, uh, the good folks in Washington gathered around this very large tumbler and put the numbers in, and they turned the tumbler one time. Now when they put the balls in, they started with January and worked up the way towards the top. Meaning that when they started pulling them out, it had only been mixed up once. The numbers that were in there from December had an unusually large number of people who had their birthdays in December. That's just the way it is. I won't go into that, but that's what it was. Um, the story is when they were starting to draw the balls from the tumbler, there were about 25 of us gathered in the Verde Lodge right in around in here. Because at the time, they had a television right there in the corner relatively large screen for the time, and they had televised the actual drawing of the balls from the tumbler. And the way it was set up, for those of you who don't know, if you had a ball that was pulled and you were at the top 120, if you did not have a student deferment, back your bags Vietnam. That's just what it's going to be. Uh, 121 to 240, you had a pretty good chance that you, if you did not have a student deferment, you'd still be okay. If you were 241 up, they would draft you right after they got your mother. You know? <laughs> so, uh, when they started drawing, we were up here and they drew the first hundred. And I didn't hear my number. And I'm going, this is cool. This is good. They drew the second hundred. Still no number for my date. Very nice. They drew the third hundred. And still had not gotten my number. I'm going, Okay, I probably missed her, I'm probably number two. And they continued to draw when I was three or so. So, uh, several of my friends were up around 300 or above 241, too. Several of them, sadly, were only in school to stay out of Vietnam. And when they got a number of them, guaranteed they probably would not be going to Vietnam. They never saw them again. They never came back to school. Because they were only here, student mm -hmm. funding, that's all. Mm -hmm. And it happened right here. Television right there. Did you stay in school anyway? I stayed in school. That's that was here while I was here. I stayed in school. I was here to get a degree, but I was 28. In the I'm, I'm sorry? I was here to get a degree, but I was 28 in the lottery. 28? So highly motivated to keep my GPA. Oh, absolutely. Out. Good motivation. Were you here when the. Uh, there was a student activity where they kidnapped professors to raise money mm -hmm. and had made a corral out in Johnson Hall, put them in jail, mm -hmm. and I was sitting on the balcony with, since I can't pay students, <laughs> who was a photographer for Chaos, and we saw the, Chaos. And we saw the <laughs> National Guard truck come down the hill and the troops start pouring out because someone called them and said the students were rioting and kidnapping professors. <laughs> These were interesting times, though. Do you have any stories about family, generations, what mom means to particular families? My, my son, um, I, I went to mom and I was very glad I did and was thrilled with the opportunity. But I wanted my children to go, the opportunity to go away to college. So my daughter did. She went away to college. She was ready to go. And my son, I was encouraging him to do the same thing. And I can remember hearing him on the telephone saying, I've disappointed my mother because I've decided to go to mom. <laughs> and he got off the phone. And I said, you haven't disappointed me. You've made the right decision for you. And he attended for two years just to grow up and then went on to Ohio State and finish his degree. 
But it, again, mom hadn't been here and he worked the whole time. He was here, not at mom. He, he'd always had two or three jobs, but he was able to go to mom and get through those first growing pains before he went on to I State. As well as college has become so expensive. My last intern was $45,000 and when he graduated. So I'm taking the opposite perspective. I, before Mike Pratt retired, uh, he and I were trying to instill in my 10-year-old grandson that maybe he would come yeah. to mom. I, I used to tell my students all the time. I, you know, I taught Middletown High School. I had a wide variety of students. And they would say, oh, I can't go to college. I can't get a scholarship. I may have to just go to mom. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> I just went to mom, and it was a great place to go. It was a great place to start. I did my whole career here other than student teaching. But um, I, I lobbied for mom the whole time because it isn't just mom. It, it, it's a great university. That's exactly right. That is right. Yeah, I was one of the, I was the second graduating class of the Bachelor of Integrative Studies degree, and at the time they said it can be completed on the regional campuses, but it can't be completed at one of the regional campuses. You would have to go to Middletown and Hamilton to complete it. So I made it my mission to prove them wrong, and I took every <laughs> single course in Middletown. <laughs> I, think, I think if Miami, Middletown would have been here, I don't even know if I'd have been able to attend college, because I didn't have more money. And I, I worked while I was here. I worked at McGowan's, if you guys remember the store McGowan's. Yeah, and uh, so I, you know, once I got up, got about a year and a half here, then I uh, worked in a factory, and I knew that mm -hmm. I wanted to get back into college. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I saved enough money and eventually went to Oxford and got my degree. Again. But Miami, if that Miami Milton hadn't been here, I don't know if I'd been able to do this. Same thing with me. Yeah. yeah. There was another trick if you were trying to save money, and that was you could take as many classes as you wanted to once you became full-time status. <laughs> so there were times I took 22, 25 credit hours. Um, you do what you have to do. And you, if at that point I enjoyed uh, studying and reading. Uh, between political science and history and English, sometimes I read a book a day. Uh, but then they decided you couldn't do that. <laughs> but that was a great cost saver, and you know, I hate to admit this, but there were one or two professors, like Harold Nadel or a few others, you could take an incomplete if you had to, and you had a certain amount of time to make it up. So you always had, I did, one in the back pocket. It's like, you're my incomplete if I need you, <laughs> and I promise I will make it up two weeks after the quarter or semester, and I did, and so I graduated in three years. That's a fourth of the tuition savings. Yeah. By today's standards, that's well, a I sports car. I don't know where it's, <laughs> it's It was $240. A, a, see, it was trimesters, I think, when I first came. Trimesters, $240 a trimester. You only had to go to two trimesters for a full school, school year. So, I mean, that was a lot of money at the, mm -hmm. back in the day, but still, it's a lot cheaper than it is nowadays. And I just thought of another member of my family, my husband. My husband, another story, um, flunked out at UK. Before I knew him, he came up to mom. We had an economics, cl economics class, and a, he was a business major, so that was what we crossed paths there. And I was a social studies major, so we also crossed paths in uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Fanning's government class. And and I could, the thing about that was I would work the switchboard before I went to uh, Dr. Fanning's class. So when I got there, there was no room at the back back. But there was always this empty seat next to Larry. <laughs> but he completed his classes here and because he had done what you did, what Judy did. He worked at uh, Armco and he says, I'm not doing this. He came back. My grades went straight up. The only way I could see him was go to the library. <laughs> you know what's nice too is not only you had classes here, but you had a library where you could study. Yep. You had a place here in Dirty Lodge where you could socialize. I mean, we came up here for lunch every day. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, but it, it wasn't just classes. You could do other things here, too. So that's what was I went to the Sorghumation area. <laughs> that was where I found most of the people that I wanted to talk to. And so that was downstairs as you're coming in the doors from the eastern doors from the uh, Gardner-Harvey Library. 
and there was all kinds of machines that you could mm -hmm. buy food. There was no fancy place to eat back then, but we just you went there and you had a good time. In four years, I talked to a lot of wonderful people. <laughs> and uh, I'm a first time from my family, I was a first time student to come to college. Uh, so Miami meant everything to me. It was the place for uh, meeting new friends, learning new things, and becoming the teacher that I always wanted to be since I was three years old. So mom meant everything to me. I have a family connection, I hope, coming up this year. And I started here the first year that it was opened in 1966. So 50 years is some point forever. <laughs> um, but uh, my granddaughter, who is 16, is planning to come and do the, what they used to call post-secondary option, I believe it's called something else now, this coming fall. So 50 years later, my granddaughter's going to be coming. Uh, so, yeah. Just in relation to what Eleanor said about you could take as many <laughs> classes as you wanted to. Um, when I was taking a full load, I also signed up for voice lessons from Helen Ramsdale. Oh. Oh. And I could never have afforded those on my own. I'm still singing. I gave my first recital when I was 60 years old for Helen and her friends at Mount Pleasant on Valentine's Day 2008. It was the most wonderful experience of all the places I've sung, but to actually have met Helen and to have had her in my life, uh, she's an icon here in Middletown, Helen Gerber Ramsdale, and we just lost her a few years ago, or two years ago, and 107 years old. And to have had her in my life because I took a couple extra hours. You know, what a blessing that was. So, I'm still singing because of mom. <laughs> Can we talk more about student organizations? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> there were none in first year, but I can remember. We all worked. <laughs> I was one of the first cheerleaders. There were five of us, and, and I even have my letter from back in the day, okay? So, and we had forensics, which we mentioned, student government, which many of us were part of. Um, what else was there? The newspaper. Chaos. Oh, chaos. Yeah, I can tell an interesting really. story about chaos. I was sitting in a classroom, and afterwards the professor came to me and said, we'd like for you to serve on the communications council. And at the time, believe it or not, I was a quiet little student, so I'm thinking, that uh, doesn't sound like something for me. And then I realized the editor at the time, that these people all know, <laughs> that I can't mention, uh, was, under, was going to be fired for a picture he put on the front page of Chaos asking which was porn, the couple making love or the guy being shot from yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. And they evidently knew how I would vote on that council. <laughs> so the faculty was trying to load the council, whether he should be fired, saying, which do you think is pornographic? So we were controversial. We were willing to step out and speak. Um, I think, as she says, the forensics, the, the speakers bureau, the radio, uh, the sports, it, it was all here. And opportunities I think that other regional campuses did not have, and I would vouch that maybe even some colleges didn't offer as many opportunities. Well, and the good thing was, too, in classes you could talk about it. The professors were very open, and, and we could talk about Vietnam. I mean, we'd have one semester of a class, we'd have a certain amount of students, and the next semester, a lot of them didn't quite make the grade, and they were drafted, they were gone. I mean, it, that happened several different times. It's like, what happened to so-and-so? He, he got drafted. And by the time I was here from 1970 to 1974, so by the time I was getting ready to leave, they were coming back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were um, taking you know, classes 
here at the campus. And also during those years, I worked at Miami, I mean the uh, library, the Gardner Harvey Library. And um, you always had a lot of people that you could find out about Vietnam. If they wanted to, they talked to you. Some people didn't really want to talk about the experiences. And it was open, it was open. Like you said before, the age group. I mean, I, I remember one when I first came here in 1970, we had a lady who had graduated from high school in 1934 in one of my classes. So we learned so much to give and take with each other. Um, and they were all apart. We never, we accepted everybody. And that's what was the nice part. You could be accepted in a place that you didn't think you might be accepted. Age, or, age meant no difference, you know, made no difference. I know Tim and I have talked, and Diane may remember, but there was also a, a portion of time where inmates from Lebanon Correctional Institute came. Oh, yes. And I think they liked playing pool better than being in class. I don't know if that <laughs> experiment lasts a long time, but that was also quite the experience. The first production in the Dave Finkelman Auditorium was the 20th Mission by Malcolm Saddam, and it was about his experience uh, in World War II, but the lead actor was a Vietnam vet and pilot uh, who was here on campus. I actually had a small bit of it. I apologize. I'm a recent graduate. Um, I just graduated in May this year, 2016. I was a student worker at Dave Finkelman Auditorium beginning, it was at the end of my freshman year, I'd been in Mike McVeigh's theater class, and he was looking to recruit some more students for his crew because it had undergone nine months of renovations. If anybody has been in since then, there's new seats, there's, um, it's handicap accessible, the bathrooms were redone. Uh, he was looking for some more student crew, so I said, okay, I don't really have any crew experience. I did acting in high school. Um, that, was, that was it, though. <laughs> so I showed up. Could hardly find the stage, got lost a few times, <laughs> and uh, the rest is history. I worked there up until, I think, a few days before I graduated this spring, <laughs> and it was, I mean, that, that place, that is like, I mean, this whole campus is a home base, but the auditorium will always be so special to me. I actually performed there in a few dance recitals um, as a kid. I spoke my first lines on stage ever on that stage. And my coworkers and I were the best of friends. I mean, we did so much in that building. We painted the stage. We were we were cleaning up after events. We were there late at night, early in the morning. You know, got to see so many concerts, so many um, performers come in and out of those doors. The whole wall of signatures. Has anybody seen that? It's still intact, thankfully. <laughs> We've added to it. We've seen people add to it. We even started a new wall <laughs> at the back by the. Um, equipment elevator. There's a whole brand new section of names there. Um, and that actually, that um, working there sort of led me to restart the Bunny Hall Players. I know we were talking about organizations. Oh, yeah. Anybody familiar with Bunny Hall Players? <laughs> um, Bunny Hall Players. When I wanted to help restart it, it had been, I think, the third, it was the third reactivation. And I had a few coworkers help me out, um, a few friends. And we had people come and go for the past few years. Uh, we were in and out of different positions in the club, president, vice president, secretary. We wrote all of our own productions. We performed two in uh, Finkelman, and we did, I think, three in this space right here. Um, so now Verity has a, a whole new special meeting for me. And it was, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of fun. Uh, it gave people an outlet to perform here, and I don't think people really thought that they could do that. I know I didn't think that I could. I mean, when I first started here, I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know what I was going to major in, <laughs> didn't know where I would fit in, who I would meet. I was scared to death, had no idea. Um, and by the end of that year, when I started at Finkelman, it just, I think, made me realize that I could fit in in so many ways. And <laughs> eventually I was like, you know what, we should, we should restart the drama club. We should, if it's not here, we're just going to make it be here. <laughs> we're going to take it over and and start again, and I think I think Finkelman was the beginning of it. 
you know, I worked in the campus and community center as well, Office of Student Affairs. I was on student government for a while, just started to find more and more places to fit in. And it slowly did become home, so I know exactly what you're all talking about with that feeling. We were all scared. And I cried. <laughs> I was going to say, back in the 70s when I was on campus, it was campus community players. And it was both students on campus performing, as well as community uh, members not involved with the campus, um, having the opportunity to perform. Um, we did all kinds of uh, major productions. Um, one I remember was the Glass Menagerie that we had Mercedes McCambridge as a guest artist. Um, our campus playing the role of the mother, and that was something very special at the time. Um, back then, there was a light board backstage instead of in the booth. Um, it was very difficult to run, but uh, quite a challenge as well. Um, running carbon arc follow spots out of the booth um, was a big challenge. Um, changing arcs in the middle of the production with uh, pliers and uh, heat resistant gloves, um, <laughs> climbing up to the grid to put counterweights on uh, the ropes for the drops and we had a lot of fun in the theater and I'm glad you still uh, are doing that. What was it called? What was the theater group called when you were here? Ours, ours was Camps Community Players. Right. I was part of that. And that was, yours was Bunny Hollow? Ours was the third reactivation, but we kept the name. It, it survived until that one. I think it's because of this area being Bunny Hollow. It was all good. Does anybody still have the Bunny Hollow Tech sweatshirt besides me? <gasps> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I can't get into it. <laughs> and my kid has one too, and it's a size two. Oh. <laughs> no, but I remember having these drapes here. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And going sledding. Uh -huh. Well, I think one thing that this campus has contributed to, to my family, my, besides my son going here for a couple of years, my husband and I getting, but my, I got all my classes here, he had to go to Miami to finish his, but was the Artists and Lecture Series. Mm -hmm. um, I have two grown children who take their, th th their spouses and they go to the Broadway series in the towns where they live. They are involved in the arts of as mostly watching and, and appreciating, but it's because of the artists and lecture series. We'd bring them up here. I mean, when, when we first got married, we were so poor. I said, I'm going to buy one ticket because I got one free for being a student because I was a student for mm -hmm. so 12 years off and on. So and I said, if you can go with me, fine. If not, I'll take your mother or friend with me. And as the kids got older, uh, when Claire Easton did it, she always had an international group come in, some, you know, someone from a foreign country that gave some sort of a native dance, and always brought my kids to that. And it, that was, it's still a big part of the community, and a big part, I think, of my children's appreciation of the arts. I think, you know, they had two-year degrees here, too, because my brother came here and got a two-year degree, and then he got a better job at A.K. Steele, which was the Arco. Then he would have had, and he, he didn't go into Oxford, he did get a two year degree. And there were some good free concerts. Who yes. was here for Country Joe and the Fish? Yes. <laughs> yes. I was. Was that the one on the hillside? Uh, I, yeah. I, I was security for that, and. I <laughs> <laughs> witnessed my first run over to us and to get some young woman to breathe into a bag until the EMTs got there. But if I tell the whole truth, the security crew had gone out into the woods where some students had camped the night before to drink and party, and some neighbor wasn't happy with that and came out with a shotgun and ran them off. So they left all their beer out in the weeds. And we went out and gathered up all the beer. The security group had their own party. <laughs> No names, 
Ted Nugent. Ted Nugent is the opening act for Brownsville Station. The place was packed, and it was my first concert like that. <laughs> it was interesting. And since I was a stringer for the Dayton Daily News, I got to go interview Brownsville Station afterwards. And, but the idea that Ted Nugent was an opening act, my son was impressed with that. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the other had alluded to the fact that the staff on site here seemed to care much more about the student. And just as a student, they were really interested in learning about your personal life. Uh, I graduated with a double major in accounting and marketing, and as such, I had to take three business law courses. Uh, the man I had for two of them, who I won't mention his name this time, uh, and I became very good friends. This was decades ago, and we were still good friends. He's a professor, he's allowed to say his name. Yes. Yes. Wayne State. Wayne State, I knew you were going to say it. Yeah. Wayne and Larry took classes together, wrote community together at Oxford. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wayne went here and then became a professor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any stories about the community of Middletown and the campus, the community of Middletown? Claire Easton was. Uh, involved not only with the uh, community here at Mum, but uh, a big part of Midfest. Mm -hmm. yes, and uh, uh, each year uh, we had a cultural event and uh, Claire would not only uh, make sure that, well, Claire would make sure that they would perform uh, here on the campus as well as during Midfest, but they would also make sure that they would visit as many schools and perform, too. So a lot of the kids got a cultural uh, uh, background uh, that maybe the parents still would not bring them out to uh, Midfest or to the uh, free events here, you know, on the campus. But uh, and she was really so, instrumental in Sandra Ross was a English teacher here. She only taught here a few years. She was I had her though and she was one of those teachers. I can still remember. I, I still tell her the story about my paper was one that she put up in front of the whole class and said this is how not to write whatever kind of paper to write because I hadn't done my homework and didn't know what it was. So and she always challenged me so I always I did whatever she said dared me that I couldn't do. I tried. <laughs> But she started Arts in Middletown, and she got uh, artists going into local schools. She's always been a big community activist, and she was an instructor here at MUM the first, first year. It had to be, because that was my first year. What I think is neat, too, I taught at Middletown High, a lot of those other people. But it's, you know, after a while, MUM started this thing where you can get college credit and high school credit at the same time and a lot of students were coming over here and just across the streets all they had to walk and mm -hmm. I thought that was a great opportunity yes. for these students. Yes. Yes. They still do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now students from high school age on up and it becomes like we talked about just the big big community in, in the classroom. I still remember when Dr. John Hayda retired, if any of you are familiar with him. Um, my alternative traditions in film class threw him a surprise party. <laughs> and he, I think he said it was the third that week, the third, <laughs> the third party type deal. We sent one of the students up to tell him, our class is missing, they're not there. And we knew he wouldn't fall for it, but we got him a cake uh, made to look like a film clapboard with his name on it. <laughs> we clapped when he came in the room and had a, a slideshow for him and it was it was a great moment I think <laughs> that, that I'll probably carry with me for a long time. Do you have any messages for future students? Any messages or thoughts for future students? Get involved. Mm -hmm. I think that's what saved me was I was so terrified and then 
when Jim Slager contacted me to be a student worker and I started being a student worker and was in the student affairs office and then I learned about all the opportunities on campus and other jobs and student organizations to be involved in. I mean that's where you really get embraced by the campus and the community. If you're just a student and you're just coming to class and going home, you don't get that experience. And so I would say get involved. <laughs> In my job, I, I have two high schools that I'm responsible for, Franklin High School and Fenwick High School. So I'm often talking to seniors about coming to college. Some of the advice I give them comes from my own experience of find a place deep in the library to study, face the wall so cute girls don't distract you, <laughs> take the glasses off, uh, ideally find a smart girlfriend, <laughs> and study more than party kids. Yeah. And as you work hard the first year and, and do as you say, dedicate yourself to find yourself working in the library constantly, then the rest of it falls in place so much more easily. Mm -hmm. And, you don't, and you don't, don't cycle. Don't let that final cost of how much going to college is going to be deter you from taking that first step. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you think, oh, it costs 35000 65000 to go to college, you know, and that's just too much. Take a class or two. Mm -hmm. Take a step or two, and somebody will help you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you don't know anything about scholarships mm -hmm. or uh, loans or whatever, somebody is going to help you. And I think you get more help on a small college yes. mm -hmm. uh, campus than you do on the larger campuses. I think if you have trouble with one of, one of the classes and you're not understanding it, be sure and go in and talk to the professor on the side because they have hours where you can go in and, mm -hmm. and talk to them and get extra help. I think that helped a lot. And just, just don't give up. Just work study, hard. Like you said, don't study. party so much, but work hard. Mm -hmm. If you are concerned about the amount of money that you need. Um, you always can find a job at Miami and Middletown. Uh, there's plenty of jobs and uh, you can find one that will help you. And also will help you meet new people, meet friend, make new friendships. Friendships I've had for years start at the library. John. <laughs> the commuter campus presents some different obstacles though. I don't know if this is true for the rest of it. My father viewed reading as goofing off, so living at home and commuting to campus, coming to the library to study was critical because if dad saw me sitting around reading, in his mind, I wasn't working and he would find something for me to do. <laughs> and I spent all my life with Judy said, uh, depending especially on what kind of course you're talking about, uh, I can tell you from personal experience, if you're taking accounting classes, don't get behind. It's a very definite building block course. If you don't understand it now, you're in trouble come next month, next quarter. Because it's built on what you were supposed to learn. And if you don't learn it, you're in trouble. So make sure you stay calm. I think a lot of students like form groups to study together too. I mean, friends you meet there. And then I think, don't you have tutors here too? Now, I don't know that we have them, but there's tutors now. <coughs> Just working together in groups, I think, and studying together kind of helps too. Yeah. It's not hard to become part of a team here, or multiple teams. <laughs> um, whether it's jobs, organizations, your classmates, your professors. It, I just, I mean, it's just like Alex said, get involved and find your place, find your team. Um, I think it makes it worth it, you know, coming here, uh, if you have to, you know, take classes for three to five years, you run as a lot of fun when you're doing it, and, and be around people that support you um, and care about your well-being and your success. Um, because it's, you know, and then, and then by the time you do graduate, you can say, well, it's an ending, but it's not a goodbye. That's what I kept telling myself this spring. It was an emotional time, um, knowing that I was leaving my jobs. But you can always come back, you can always, um, Visit your family. <laughs> you can come back and find a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Closing thoughts? 
since it sounds like several of us went into education, if you make education a career, college never ends. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to tell a story. Um, I guess it would be the first snowstorm that we had the first year. And, you know, we'd all come into this campus, which is down in this bunny, bunny hollow, <laughs> and we have this big snowstorm and they cancel classes, but nobody comes to clear the snow. So everyone, all the guys had to push everybody up the hill to get back home. And I still think about, what about those last two guys? Yeah. <laughs> story when I was here, like the first year, somehow the salt truck had broken down or something, and they said, at the top of the hill, they said, just bump your tire all the way along. And so, I mean, here, thank God I got down there, but as I got into the building, the Thescan Hall, uh, it was Science and Tech then, I was watching, and there were people coming down, and they were running into trees, and all kinds of stuff, and I thought, oh my God, what is going to happen? <laughs> and it was, it was just something else that day. Well, the speed bumps, too. I mean, oh, it was the only way you could get out was to go fast up the hill to get the speed bumps. <laughs> yes. On one of those winter storms, the parking lot out here, the car up top slid, hit the car next to it, and down the hill. I mentioned Joe, the security cop, who got a fond reaction, just as, as one other comment about him. Years later, I tracked him down, and he did our wedding. Oh, oh he did a wedding. He was a day minister. Yes, he was. And uh, he spent many uh, an all night doing our theater productions with us, too. And uh, it was a great guy. He was a man. man. <laughs> yes. Whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> and two aspirin. <laughs> Well, I think one thing that's a fond memory is if you came to this campus and if you worked on the campus, whether an activity or paid worker, I was a paid worker, um, the, the place really became a family. I can still remember names. I, we were just talking about Mildred Gasson. She was here. That's when I went over to Monroe. I remember her. Um, Mrs. Lemieux, uh, Dallas Gonzalez, I forget what her maiden name was. Um, Lois Lafayette. Lois Lafayette. They were, these are, uh, Mrs. Johnson, these were all the secretaries, or people who worked in the office, but they, they were friends of ours. They were helpers as much as the, as much as the teachers were, the instructors were. Do you remember Ola May? Yes. Oh, she was the sweetest thing. She took, she was kind of like a mother to us, as students. I mean, she yeah. would just take over and just kind of guide us. If we had any problems, we'd even talk about our problems to yeah. her. She was a great lady. Carol Cadell was that for me. Yeah. Yes. And Tom Beard. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mary Lou Flynn was a great inspiration to me, too. She was a scholarship uh, and admissions uh, officer. Well, as you mentioned social studies, did you have Dr. Baxter? Oh, yes. How many times did he take his classes off the <laughs> <laughs> And Don Ferris would say, and this thing, and this thing, and one girl spent the whole period not taking notes, but making a mark every time. He said, and this thing, and at the end, it was 103 marks in 45 minutes. <laughs> And you can't talk about the campus the first few years without talking about Dr. Bergstrom, who did I have the one oh. giant uh, lecture yes. class. And, and it was the first time we'd ever, I had ever heard teachers saying bad words, <laughs> 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 talking about sex. He was, he was a biology teacher, but he talked about lots of things I'd never heard teachers talk about before. <laughs> and it was cold in that room, but I remember right, it was a great big room. 
It's where I think it's where the eating establishment is now. Yes. Right? Yes. Oh yes. yes. But I remember Virginia Brown and Jenny. I remember all of those people that I uh, worked for, and they cared for us too. They were kind of like a surrogate mother. They were good people, good memories. Dr. Bennett even, I mean, I had an incident happen on the way. Used to, if the, to get to the campus, I didn't have a car, I didn't have any money, I didn't have anything. I, I, had to, I had to take the city bus to Fenwick and walk up the hill, or I could, if I went early enough, I could take the city bus all the way up here. But if I didn't, I had to stop it, like get off there, the bus didn't come any further, and walk up the hill. And um, I had a very traumatic incident happen on the way up here, and Dr. Bennett got me in that office, would not let anyone talk to me. He wanted to make sure I was okay, everything was all right. You know, it, it, doc, you know, the head of the campus cared about me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, back then, uh, when I was here, it was hard to get into the Oxford campus from high school sometimes. And if you didn't have the correct scores or the grades or whatever, so you could come here and then automatically get over there, which mm -hmm. that, that was nice. Because, I mean, maybe you needed a year or two to get your life together and then right. go over there and most of it. I think it's even more so now. I know Wayne Staten talked one time. He said, we couldn't get in here now uh, over at Oxford. But I think there's a lot of people that come here and like you say, get their life together, uh, get their feet on the ground, and, and then become a yeah. success at Miami and yeah. Oxford. Thank you.